Northeast LA for five years. Kevin, where are you? Kevin? Don't let his quiet demeanor fool you. He's very uh, active uh, around the office. Uh, Martin Schlagener is not here. He's another Eagle Rock resident. He said he was going to be here. He's my policy director. And last but not least, Paul Beat, my chief of staff, who was my Eagle Rock director for a number of years. Not my chief of staff. So if we can get started. Um, that was the uh, welcome. And now we're going to go into policy. Uh, my role as a council member, and when people decide to elect our council member, for the city of Los Angeles, uh, we really have two dual roles. One is to set policy for the city, which takes up a lot of time and effort. We meet in our city council meetings uh, three times a week, and then we have a number of committee meetings. And that takes a big part of my job. My second part of my job is to serve the district that I was elected from on constituent matters and be the link between the constituency and city hall. On um, policy issues, one of the issues that has taken up a lot of our time uh, in council, in my council district, has been homelessness. And it's something that has been something that uh, the city council as a whole has been addressing more holistically. But the fact of the matter is, is that it hasn't been until recently that the city council and the city as a whole really started to address homelessness. Up until five years ago, homelessness was addressed as a matter of, we would get sued all the time because we weren't addressing the issue. We'd settle cases and that was driving our policy. We'd react to those settlements, to writs from the courts, to, uh, we were required to do things. But within the last five years, we've become more proactive on the issue of homelessness. And why? Because now homelessness is no longer only concentrated in certain parts of the city, like Skid Row, Hollywood, and Venice, it's everywhere now. And we felt it here in Northeast LA as well. And in fact, homelessness has increased in the city of LA by 20% from last year to this year. And it is not something that is unique to Los Angeles. It's something that's happening across the United States. However, Los Angeles has the largest concentration of homeless individuals that sleep on the street. We do have that distinction, and it's not a very good distinction to have. So on the bright side, we are doing more. What have we done? Uh, a few years ago, about four years ago, I went to our council president and I said, we need a committee in council that talks about homelessness each and every day. We didn't have one. So we got a homeless committee that meets like any other committee, like the transportation committee, the planning committee, the public safety committee, so we could start thinking about homelessness as a policy issue all the time in city council. I was the first chair of that committee and then what I set out to do is we established, we, we passed what's called the, the strategic plan for homelessness because like I said before that we were just reactionary, we didn't have a proactive way to address homelessness. From that strategic plan, we wanted to uh, approach homelessness from something called housing first. That is that whatever we do, we always want to put individuals on the track to get into permanent supportive housing with services in that housing. So we passed measure HHH, thanks to the voters that supported that. We now have $1.2 billion to build 10,000 units of permanent supportive housing in the next 10 years. Now each council district has committed to build 222 units each three years for the next nine years to get up to those 10,000 so that we no longer just concentrate those service, those type of housing in certain parts of the city. What we also did from that is, so we have the long-term plan, now we're doing more immediate things to immediately start housing individuals. And in fact, what we did today in council, we passed two ordinances that I helped push to council. One is called the motel conversion ordinance that we could allow motels who want to convert to uh, provide housing for homeless to do that so long as they provide services at that location and so individuals could be housed that way get services and eventually get a track put on uh, a track to permanent supportive housing. We passed another uh, ordinance that we will fast track anybody who applies to build more housing for homeless. So we are now doing little things to implement the strategic plan, but at least we have a pathway, at least we have a direction, something that has not, uh, we haven't had in the past. One of the other things we're doing now is to immediately house those individuals who cannot get into permanent supportive housing right away. For example, we need more shelters. We simply need a place to have them go that night. The city of LA does not have enough shelter beds throughout the city. 
We recently started, we put one up at El Pueblo in a parking lot that we found where there was an increase of homeless individuals around El Pueblo. We saw that as an opportunity to show that it can work. At the parking lot, we will house 60 to 70 homeless individuals every six months on a rotating basis for three years. We will serve the immediate homeless individuals there, put them in the shelter, provide them services, and get them into permanent supportive housing. That's the idea. We want to sh show that it works so that anywhere else in the city that we try that, we will do that. I also have a motion into council right now that we want to immediately do that in Skid Row, one of the largest concentrations of homeless anywhere in the country. 2,000 people sleep on the streets. We're looking at public, uh, owned, publicly owned parking lots there to do the same there. And, and we're doing that, um, and, and we're going to get a response to that right now. I may ask for help. Uh, the mayor is going to release his budget soon, and there are two things I'm asking for. One is to provide more funding for these immediate emergency crisis housing throughout the city, in particular in concentrated areas like Skid Row. The second thing I'm asking for is to provide more funding to clean up ho homeless encampments. We right now have to follow certain protocols when we pick up when we pick up encampments. We send out social workers first, uh, advise them that we're going to be back to clean up the encampment, ask them if they need help, do they need uh, shelter that night, do they need some type of job training, how can we assist them, and then we go clean up if they're blocking the public right away. The problem we have is that we have about a backlog of 5,800 encampment cleaners. Now if that's not bad, get this, each month the backlog increases by 200 more requests. We simply do not have enough resources throughout the city to clean up encampments. What I'm asking for in this next budget is to double the size of, of uh, resources we have, people in sanitation, outreach workers to go out and clean up encampments more often when they are blocking the public right of way. Now, here in Northeast LA, we've seen is, as many of you have noticed, an influx of homelessness in certain parts of the area. Uh, we have had uh, um, recycled resources as a partner to provide some outreach uh, services in the area. And they have a shelter at All Saints Church in Highland Park. That is one of the very few shelters in Northeast LA, and we need more to provide places where we can take these individuals because Although we may think that homeless are these strangers sleeping on our streets, many of them are our neighbors or community members that just simply cannot make it anymore. Uh, there's a misperception that in Los Angeles, a majority of our homeless population comes from other states or other places, but when you really dig deep, you find that these are individuals who are from the local area, haven't been, who've been here uh, longer than uh, a few years. Um, so um, we're hoping to find uh, another shelter in Northeast Delay to assist the Saints Church and recycle resources. They are simply overwhelmed. But we also have been working them to do more outreach. So they not only provide the shelter, but they're going around Northeast LA in outreach teams to assist individuals, see if we can shelter them, find a place for them. And uh, I'm hoping that next year that we uh, double uh, the number of outreach workers we have in Northeast LA to assist individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, one of the things that uh, we do every year uh, is uh, my wife and I have a drive for uh, uh, women who are homeless. Uh, they is a particular population that has additional needs, um, uh, uh, sanitary materials or toothbrushes, cl uh, clothing, um, whatever it is. We have a drive and anybody who wants to assist with that, you could ask at the front table and there's a drop-off center here at our Eagle Rock. City Hall. Uh, last but not least, uh, on homelessness, one of the things that I've been advocating for is that we urge the state to change what, how they define gravely disabled. About a third of our homeless individuals have mental health issues, and we are limited on how we address them to assist them. Right now, our first response to them is our police officers, our paramedics, our firefighters, but at the end of the day, it's not a response that these law enforcement individuals should be doing. They need mental health assistance. They may be taken in for uh, a couple of days and then released again and have nowhere to go because we do not have enough psychiatric, psychiatric beds. Uh, so I'm urging the state to, number one, increase the number of psychiatric beds 
and find some funding to do that. We've disinvested from that over the last few decades. And secondly, change the definition of gravely disabled because right now it's very difficult because of past legal precedents to commit some of these individuals who basically need assistance. And you've seen them in our streets. They can't care for themselves. Uh, and they are not naturally dangerous, but left untreated without making the medication, we do see some instances where these individuals can get dangerous and they're a danger to, to all of us. So um, we're urging the state to make some changes as well. Um, and the good news as well is in terms of providing more services is that thanks to Measure H, which was a county proposal, we now have about $350 million each year that the county uses to provide more health and human services for our homeless population. So while we've seen an increase, I think we've seen a new, more focused and active response both by the city and the county, but it's not only our responsibility, we're urging the state to step up and do some work as well. Uh, so that's the issue on, uh, on homelessness. I would mention that uh, one final thing on affordable housing, the linkage fee. Uh, we passed this past year a, what we call a new linkage fee, that's a development fee that we will charge new development. That will, go, that will go to our affordable housing trust fund. The affordable housing trust fund will be monies available to match with federal and state dollars to build more affordable housing. We anticipate that we will collect about $100 million more uh, to be available a year for affordable housing because affordable housing, as many of you know, uh, right now we are living in a time where we have some of the highest rents we've ever seen. And uh, interestingly, one of the largest populations of homeless individuals now are people who simply cannot pay their rent. And that is a new type of demographic that we hadn't seen in the past from people becoming homelessness. So the linkage fee will hopefully go a long way in preventing homelessness by providing funds available to build more affordable housing. Um, the next issue that I uh, have uh, focused on is on our youth. Uh, one of the things, uh, I came from the school board. I, been now a council member for the last 12 years. Prior to this, I was on the LAUSD board. And uh, back then, we had a more robust discussion about how the city serves our young people uh, and how we connect services, our libraries, and our schools, and our parks. Uh, but some of that discussion has gone away. Why? Because back then, we had what was called a Commission for Children, Youth, and Family. Uh, we also had some other agencies that, was fo that were focused on kids, but through the downturn in the economy and the severe budget cuts that we made at the time in the early uh, the mid-2000s, uh, many of those uh, focus points and services were cut. But now it's time, I think, that we start rebuilding that, uh, and I put in a motion to study the possibility of creating a youth development uh, department and or commission or something that will once again start focusing on youth. Why? Because we want our young people to have other opportunities and services, but on top of that, it affects us all. Because <coughs> helping our youth at an early age and assisting them to do positive things um, um, keeps them away from gangs and into uh, a negative lifestyle that affects us all. Uh, my wife actually was the assistant general manager for the Commission for Children, Youth, and Families uh, back then, and uh, she actually, uh, working with her and some youth in the area, came up with the idea to once again start tackling that. And hopefully that passes in this next budget cycle. Next is parks. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did this past year is that we examined what's called the Quimby fee. The Quimby fee is a fee charged under development that will provide funding for parks in the immediate area around that development. The issue was that those fees had not been looked at for over 30 years. While right now we have this development boom, it was an opportunity for the city to see if we could re-look re at those fees, update them, and possibly get more funding to provide for our parks. We examined those, and we will now have about $30 million more million uh, available to, for maintenance and new parks in the area. Uh, and this would go a long way. So for example, here in Eagle Rock, uh, one of the things that has been an issue at Eagle Rock Park has been the upper level rails that have been broken for a very long time. We have a quote from Reckon Parks, which is $250,000, but Reckon Parks is broke. We have nowhere to get funding for that. This Quimby reform may help that 
uh, and we will fix that uh, this coming year and fix those railings up uh, at, uh, at Eagle Rock Park. Uh, also locally at Yosemite uh, Park, we recently fixed the lights. That was an issue simply of maintenance. The copper wires had been stolen from the lights there. That's something that not only happens on our parks, but other areas. When you see a light out on some street, you might want to call our office or 311. Uh, a lot of times it's not the bulk, it's that we still have a lot of copper theft in the, in the city. Um, we're doing things to help uh, install uh, more difficult ways for people to get into where the copper is. Uh, so that's um, on our parks. And um, you know, going back to the environment, I briefly wanted to touch on this because of the environment, environmental issues are something that I focused a lot as a council member as well. So when you ask what is my council member spending his time on? Uh, and when I was the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee, we actually passed two very important solar power uh, policies. One is called the Eden Tariff that allows people to more um, uh, efficiently and uh, with less cost put solar power over commercial buildings. We also passed uh, or we approved two of the largest solar projects in America that now, now help supply about 5% of all the power that the Department of Water Power gets. And given those two policies, we were recently designated as a city as the number one in solar power uh, according to a report called Environment America. So that's something that we should be proud of. Also recently, we uh, got all our buses in the city of LA. We have two, 350 Dash and Commute Express buses that in the future, uh, in the near future, as we replace them, all of them will have zero, or they will be 100% zero emission bus fleet. Uh, and that's very good news. Um, we are also uh, here locally, as many of you know, with Shoal Canyon. Thanks to you, we were able to defeat the expansion of Shoal Canyon that is right here next to us in Glendale. <laughs> the issue with that is that it should, as many of you know, if they had expanded Shoal Canyon, the majority of the ingress, ingress, ingress and egress uh, is here through Eagle Rock. We see an increase of trucks, pollution. Uh, on top of that, not to mention, uh, we weren't quite sure what the environmental impacts would be for people living so clo close to the dump. So the good news is that we were able to defeat that, but unfortunately, uh, Glendale uh, once again uh, proposed a power plant to burn the landfill gas that is produced at Shoal Canyon. Uh, so we um, have been able to convince the commission to do a full environmental impact report as opposed to an MND. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't do the project, it just means that they have to go back and further study the environmental impacts, but it gives us an opportunity to look at those impacts and see what they mean for us and then be able to fight, fight it at the right time. Uh, the city council, once the commission uh, decided, just last night the city council, I believe, now has decided to study it further for another 90 days. So thanks to you, some of you, uh, some of Rock residents were there testifying. The staff uh, has been very active on the issue as well. And I hope we can continue to, uh, to keep an eye on it and uh, we shall continue to keep an eye on, on that. And finally, uh, one of the issues that I was uh, happy to uh, work on was that prior to uh, this past year, uh, 29 of the city's 35 community plans had not been updated for 15 or more years. Now, why is this important that, that, that you know, why should we be concerned that the community plan is not updated? There's different demographic changes, different, uh, commercial changes or, or there's changes in the community, but if the community plan does not uh, update it with modern growth or direct that growth, uh, there's going to be a mismatch between what the community wants and what's allowed. So somebody might come in and want to build something and it might be allowed and the community is saying, well, how could that be so? Look at how the community has developed differently. And so what I, wanted, what I did as the chair of the Planning and Land Use Committee now is that uh, beginning in uh, all the 35 community plans will be updated by 2024 and we're required now by ordinance to update them every six years after that. And here in Eagle Rock, uh, we are in the Northeast Community Plan and we can expect public workshops to begin uh, by early uh, 2020 or late 2019 so that we update our own Northeast Community Plan and that's something that we should all watch out for 
so that we could get input into what we would like to see our community look like in the future. And now the other part of my job as your elected representative on the city council is constituent services. And that is one of our highest priorities. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, one of the issues that we are most uh, get the most calls into our office is graffiti. Uh, the good news is that we have a very robust program to take down graffiti. We have a policy that if anybody contact, contacts us, we want to take down graffiti within 48 hours. We contract with a group called the Northeast Graffiti, graffiti Busters, and they work seven days a week. Uh, they've been very active. Um, in this past uh, fiscal year, they've removed more than 2,200,000 thousand square feet of graffiti from close to 59,000 locations in Northeast LA. And so I want to remind everyone, if you do see graffiti, contact my office and or call 311 and it should be able, we should take it down within 48 hours. Uh, secondly, um, uh, uh, when we, uh, the, the types of the other calls that we get in our office, uh, they range from removals of uh, bulky items to pothole repairs to dealing with illegally parked vehicles. And my office in North, in here in Eagle Rock has been very busy uh, this past year. Uh, we closed 2,475 cases. And in Council District 14 as a whole, the city responded uh, to 37,000 uh, cases uh, for bulky item pickups alone. So you can see we're very busy uh, with that. And uh, again, that's also an issue for 311 or my office. Um, one of the things we did in, in, here in Council District 14 is we started something called the Clean Communities Initiative. The reason we started this maybe about five years ago is that, quite frankly, the city's um, services are leave a lot to want. Um, they're lacking. Uh, and so, for example, sidewalks, um, tree trimming, uh, some of the basics, it's very, it, it takes so long for the city to actually uh, come around and fix those things shouldn't come to do it. So I cobbled together different pots of money in my district and we were able to uh, do additional things aside from what's available to us each year for each council district to fix our basic needs in the community. Uh, one of the things we do, for example, is that we contract with a group called Fuego Tech. This is a group that hires young people to uh, pick up bulky items in our community uh, oftentimes you see a pile of trash somewhere and it's not just a bulky item like a tire or a refrigerator or a sofa, but just trash, a big heap of trash, um, it, it takes much longer for the city to get around to it. So our office contracts with Fuegote and if we get reported something like that, they go out and clean it up right away. Uh, they're mobile, they work uh, four days a week and they've been very good at uh, particularly illegal dumping uh, throughout uh, the area of our, our neglected areas of the of Igorot, where people go and over the night, for example, construction workers or something that have heaps of trash, it's a lot cheaper for them to dump it in a quiet, dark area than take it to the dump. They've been very good at picking those up. Also, we put up additional trash cans, things called the automated litter bins. We put in 20 additional trash cans and recycling uh, ALDs, as we call them, in the business quarters of, uh, of Northeast LA. <laughs> And finally, street resurfacing. Um, this is something that uh, we have gotten uh, additional funding for. And each year, we don't have the previous year's comparisons, but as you see up there, uh, we resurfaced 52 lane miles and slurry sealed 90 miles of streets in CD14. Slurry sealed, uh, when we slurry seal something, that adds approximately five more years to the street. Uh, it's cheaper, it's quicker, uh, and sometimes uh, it doesn't, uh, it, 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 it allows us to do more than when we completely resurface a street. And uh, we've done a fairly good job here in, in Eagle Rock. If anybody does need to get their streets slurry sealed or resurfaced, please call our office. The street services department has their own list of what streets are going to get resurfaced or slurry sealed. Um, but when, they, when you call our office, do our own examination and put it on the list too. And depending on how bad the street is, we put it on top of the list. And that gives an additional 
point of view as to which ones should get uh, fixed because the department doesn't look at how bad the condition is. They just keep doing their list that they have. They don't really go out and see which ones need to be prioritized, which ones are worse than others. Um, and, and one of the things that frustrates me the most, uh, that's been, it's been a huge frustration for me since my 12 years on the city council has been sidewalk repair. In fact, the city committed $30 million a year for sidewalk repair as part of an ADA lawsuit settlement. We were sued uh, because people who have uh, disabilities cannot get around because of how bad our sidewalks are. So the city's response to settle that lawsuit was to provide and commit $30 million a year to fix sidewalks. But now the city said, well, we're already doing $30 million. We can't do more. That's all the money we have. We actually need more money to fix sidewalks throughout the year. But what the city did, and I didn't agree with this, um, and I argued against it, was that it went out and focused on city-owned properties <coughs> and the sidewalks around city-owned properties in order to reduce legal liabilities. I was arguing we should go out and fix the most egregious ones, right? The worst ones, as opposed to, no matter where they are. Uh, but I was frustrated when my ball heights uh, city hall, I mean, the sidewalk wasn't that bad in disrepair. It had a few little cracks here and there. You look across the street at somebody's residence in front of their home, and that thing is like this. But they went around and fixed the, the sidewalks around my city hall. Uh, that's something uh, that would be difficult to fix because of the settlement. We'd have to go open up the whole thing. But um, I'm arguing that uh, we need a major public outcry to really fix that and get more equity in terms of sidewalks fixing. I will say that this next year we are developing a plan uh, that have some additional funding. Uh, like just like we did the Clean Communities Initiative to do additional um, um, work around uh, my district, we're going to allot some money uh, to do some of the most egregious sidewalks. And so if you do have a very bad sidewalk, call my office. In about six months, we're going to have new funds available here locally to fix some of the worst sidewalks. Um, and we're going to, so please contact my office if you need to fix uh, some of the a pretty bad sidewalk. So with that, let me turn to uh, public safety. And um, I want to first say that as you know, we really can't function as a community unless we feel safe to go out on our streets and conduct our everyday lives. And, uh, and, and that is one of the most important things we can address. The good news is that we have seen a continued decrease in crime in Eagle Rock. And this coincides with what we've seen throughout the city where crime has decreased. But while we saw a huge dip a few years ago in crime, not a huge dip, but it started lowering and it remained pretty steady. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, it started to slowly increase, and now it is uh, going back down again, which is very uh, good news. Our crime numbers are one of the lowest uh, here in Eagle Rock. It's one of the lowest crime rates in all of Northeast Los Angeles. Uh, but uh, as we know, one crime is too many. Uh, but I want to thank our LAPD. Uh, they do a wonderful job, uh, and they also uh, have great community uh, relations, which goes a long way. Uh, I'm going to ask Captain uh, Sandoval to come up and give a more detailed uh, explanation of some of the statistics around our crime. I also want to recognize some of our senior lead officer, Choa, who's here, and thank you for your work. <laughs> Captain Sandoval will also introduce some of our other officers right here. So please give a welcome to Captain Sandoval. Good evening, everybody. First off, thank you to the councilman for, uh, for inviting us and uh, allowing us to, uh, to be with you here tonight. The, the councilman is a strong, strong supporter of public safety. And thank you all for being here and caring so much. Um, it means a lot to us. You know, we, we've got two jobs as police officers, reduce crime and improve quality of life. Those are our two major jobs. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we're able to work in a partnership with the community. So we really appreciate the Eagle Rock community that you, you have that sort of partnership. And obviously we can always improve, but we do feel that partnership with us that you care and you want to assist in, in improving quality of life and reducing crime here in the area. Councilman introduces your senior lead officer, Fernando Ochoa. He's in the back. 
There's two other senior lead officers back there. It's uh, senior lead officer Mark Allen and senior lead officer. <laughs> and senior lead officer Lloyd Chang. <laughs> We're very, very fortunate to have some of the finest senior lead officers in the city here in Northeast. We really are. For those of you that aren't familiar with the senior lead program, let me give you a quick little synopsis. These officers are typically not going to be responding to 911 calls or patrolling for service or, or trying to take bad guys down. These are the officers that are in charge of an area. Senior lead officer at in charge of Eagle Rock here. He's responsible for ensuring the LAPD Northeast Division is doing whatever we can to improve quality of life and reduce crime within the area. He's my deputy of the area. He's in charge, kind of like the sheriff of Eagle Rock. So if you need something, if you have an issue, um, if it's something that a patrol unit isn't going to be able to assist you with, contact Officer Ochoa, and he'll be able to assist you, guide you. Again, we may not be the, uh, the person who handles your concern, your issue, but fortunately we're the ones that are going to answer the phone 24-7. Okay? Ochoa won't be there 24-7, but you call an LAPD unit, eventually we will arrive, and uh, the information will get passed on to Officer Ochoa. As the councilman stated, Eagle Rock crime numbers are, well first let me backtrack. I agree with the councilman. One crime is one crime too many. Absolutely, without a doubt. One crime is one crime too many. Fortunately for Eagle Rock, the majority of our crime here is property crime. Now I say fortunately because that means somebody's not getting hurt. Okay. Traditionally, Northeast area, 86% of our crime is property crime. 14% is violent crime. The past several years here at Eagle Rock, 9% of crime within Eagle Rock is violent crime, which means, let me do the math, 91% is property crime. Okay? Again, people breaking into cars, into homes. Fortunately, nobody's getting hurt with these crimes. We want to reduce every one of these, um, and we'll work together to reduce these. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of what a property crime is and what a violent crime is. So a property crime would be somebody stealing your car, somebody breaking into your car, somebody breaking into your house, or theft. Unfortunately, the majority of these types of crimes are folks who leave their windows unlocked, their doors unlocked, their garages open, or a, or a property in a vehicle within plain sight. If we could get us to reduce the likelihood of leaving our property unattended or unsecured, I think it would drastically reduce the amount of crime we have within, here within Northeast. With that, I'll uh, pass it back to the councilman. Uh, but I do want to just thank his staff because we have a very, very good relationship with his staff. Um, they are also strong supporters of public safety and they will do whatever we need as the Los Angeles Police Department to ensure that we are patrolling and securing and providing service to Eagle Rock. Thank you. Captain, and uh, he has uh, Captain Sandoval's 29 years of service to LAPD. He's uh, been with us three years. Uh, hopefully, you're stay with us another year so we can celebrate 30 years, right? We'll have a big party. Okay? <laughs> and, and you know, uh, LAPD is one leg in the stool to address crime in the community. Another one is uh, our youth organizations who help our youth and make sure they stay on a positive pathway. Here in Northeast LA, uh, we have Pathway Sycamores. Uh, they offer assistance to children and families. Barrio Action works to improve the quality of life for youth and families in Northeast LA. They're based in El Serena, but work up here as well. Tina Green gives employment to area youth. Um, and Summer Night Lights is a program at Highland Park and Glassall Park that provides summer activities extended hours into the nighttime so our young people have things to do throughout the summer and instead of being out in the street. Um, so um, let me now shift over to Complete Streets and this has also been a focal point of the work I've been doing not only here in Northeast LA and Eagle Rock but throughout my district. One of the things I set out to do years ago was I chose one major corridor in each part of my district 
and we had created a vision for that so that we could not only uh, so we could make it more pedestrian friendly and support the businesses. And here in, in Eagle Rock, it, we coincided at the time with Tara was looking at Colorado Boulevard to see what we could do. And we uh, moved forward with uh, implementing a concept called Complete Streets. Uh, that's a, uh, a, a, mode of the, a model of urban planning where we think of several, that uh, we not only think of cars, but we think of getting from point A to point B, that we not only measure uh, how quickly cars can get through, which has been the historic way of our Department of Transportation thinking about how we are doing as a city. In the past, the quicker we could get a car through was more successful then. Uh, that's how we measured success. But now we know that we, we want to create um, neighborhoods, we want to create uh, safe, uh, uh, safety for pedestrians and bicyclists and everyone else. We have to think of all modes of transportation. So here uh, and in Northeast LA, one of the first things uh, in Highland Park, uh, we looked at York Boulevard. Uh, we did our York Vision Plan. Uh, we installed, installed bike lanes and the city's first bike corral. Uh, we also um, had, uh, and after we did that, actually the, the city undertook and established something called the People Street Program, which uh, modeled a lot of the work we were doing in Council District 14, so that if other communities wanted to start parklets or bike corrals or or make it uh, easy installations for some of these other types of bike uses. Um, this program now has used us as a model to expand throughout the city. And like I said, here in, uh, in Eagle Rock, we Colorado <coughs> Boulevard at the same time, I was thinking of looking at Colorado Boulevard. Tara was very interested in doing something. So in 2011, uh, we came together and we had several meetings, in particular Bob Gotham, uh, they were in, in Tara, along with the Naval Council, the, RB and the Eagle Rock Chamber of Commerce, we came up with a plan for Colorado Boulevard. And what we saw, what we did, we modified medians, added two new crosswalks, three recta rectangular rapid slashing beacons. We decreased the boulevard to two lanes in each direction, answering the community's call to calm traffic on the boulevard. We also installed two speed feedback signs on either side of Dahlia Heights Elementary School. We installed over two miles of buffered bike lanes on Colorado Boulevard. And the lanes stretch now from the Glendale City Limit on the west and Figueroa Street on the east. Now what was the result of all this after we studied it and we looked at whether it was a success or not? What we've seen is that we have reduced traffic accidents by 42%, while average traffic speed has only decreased by less than one mile per hour. So that's a great trick. <laughs> and uh, we have more improvements uh, coming to Colorado and Eagle Rock Boulevard, uh, Rock the Boulevard, as now Tara has called it, as we're examining uh, uh, Eagle Rock Boulevard, uh, I'm supporting that effort in any way I can. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more a little bit in, later in the section called what's coming for Eagle Rock. So uh, I wanted to now have two more sections. One is events and what events we have here. And then I'll talk about what's coming for Eagle, Eagle Rock, what we're planning. But on events, if you have any ideas of how you think we could uh, come together as a community, celebrate Eagle Rock, let us know. Uh, we'd love to support any great ideas. Uh, but here, as you can see up there, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the successful events we have is each 4th of July we celebrate uh, at Eagle Rock Park. Uh, last year we had 5,000 people who showed up. And those, for those of you who have not been, it's just a great community feeling uh, throughout the day. People are, kids are playing and running around. People are running into great food. And it's a great week for all of us to get together. I started that back uh, a few years ago because I remember as a kid I used to go to my local park and see fireworks and then when I got elected I realized that our local parks were no longer sponsoring fireworks shows and I brought that tradition back up to Eagle Rock here at Eagle Rock Park. Um, we also have our uh, Eagle Rock annual tree lighting that we work with the Eagle Rock Chamber of Commerce um, and we have about 500 uh, in attendance each year. Uh, the kids uh, get to see Santa, etc. Fire department plays an important role in that, bringing Santa all the way from the North Pole. Uh, we also have our Northeast Veterans Day Parade, uh, that we have a solemn ceremony here, uh, a solemn ceremony at the Eagle Rock City Hall. And last but not least, our Eagle Rock Music Festival, and that we work with Center for the Arts. 
When, that, when I first got elected, the music festival was only on some side streets on Colorado Boulevard. Uh, and then we brought it up to one half of Colorado. Then we made it all of Colorado. And it got really big for a while. I forgot the numbers. But over the last two years, we purposely attempted to bring it down a notch because we were so successful. We became the largest free music festival in the city of LA. Good people, people were coming from all over the place. But we said, you know, we want to make it more community oriented. Let's try to make it more for locals. Let's get more local bands uh, and kids to showcase their talents. And so over the last two, three years, we've been kind of purposely bringing it down. And it's been successful. It's not as big as it used to be, but it's still a lot of fun. And a lot of neighbors come out to celebrate and enjoy our community. So those are some of our events. Uh, we look out for them in these coming years as well. So what's next? There's, the good news is, that, uh, for Colorado Boulevard, is that we now have a total of $11.7 million at our disposal. And uh, due to the community-driven Take Back the Boulevard effort and plan, my office partnered with the Department of Transportation and Bureau of Street Services on submitting grants to both the Metro Coffin projects as well as the State Active Transportation Program. And uh, we were able to get those funds to do additional improvements on Colorado Boulevard. And we have funds of $2 million to install bus lighting at Argus and new traffic signals at Hermosa and La Rota. And we have the California Transportation Commission's uh, funding of other city improvements all along Colorado. They include pedestrian lighting from College View Avenue to Eagle Vista Avenue. 21 curb extensions at locations such as Townsend, Argus, and Maywood, a new flashing pedestrian crossing at Eagle Rock Boulevard and Burton Avenue, a new sidewalk along Colorado next to College View Avenue and in front of Pillar Hedge. By the way, that project is moving forward. Um, uh, we worked with the local community. They had some, uh, they provided some input on what they would like to see. Uh, and are you familiar with what's going up or should I describe what's going up there? There's going to be 26 unit apartment building with two units reserved for very low income households and uh, there was a lot of community input. We were able to move some of the entrances and make it not as uh, dangerous for Colorado uh, as originally proposed. Um, and, uh, but what I'm really excited about as well is that uh, Rock the Boulevard has had very successful meetings. So the next meeting is, as uh, we mentioned, the 28th. Uh, 26. 26, I'm sorry. Uh, believe it or not, I've been reading my notes with my contacts who are very blurry. But that, that's 15, 26, 28, that's what did it. Uh, and I, I was correct on $11.2 million, right? Yeah, that, that's a lot, but I was correct on that. And over the last few years, um, we've heard consistent calls for Igorot Boulevard, and I want to thank Tara for taking the leadership. And last but not least, on what's coming, uh, we have a new dog park coming to uh, Igorot Park. And that is at the request of many community members. Um, we have a groundbreaking May 5th. So I invite you to uh, the Eagle Rock Dog Park groundbreaking on May 5th. Uh, and that was a huge success because it's rare for the city to actually put in funding into our general, uh, into our general uh, fund just to allocate it for something like a dog park. But we, I told the mayor last year that this is something that Eagle Rock really wanted, and so he agreed to do it. Uh, but it's the first new dog park in Los Angeles in 10 years, so that's good news as well. Uh, so if I could wrap it up now, um, I think that concludes my presentation, and I want to thank you. Uh, I enjoy uh, serving as a council member, I, I, and one thing I particularly enjoy about Eagle Rock is that um, I, this community is proactive. Uh, you are out there leading the way. And it's not like that in every part of my district. Sometimes I have to be out there saying, hey, let's do this, let's do that. But here in Eagle Rock, many of the residents here are proactive in telling us what you would like to see, and that makes for a better community. So that concludes my presentation by uh, town, by what's it called? The state of the town. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is Martin Schlagiger, by the way. He's a Eagle Rock president. We call him Eagle Rock.
Okay, so the first one is asking, can city surplus properties be identified as possible locations for homeless and traditional uh, and transitional housing? One of our objectives in our uh, homeless strategic plan is to identify city-owned properties to build more services for our um, homeless. The first wave of public properties that we identified was to build permanent supportive housing, and now we are in a second wave where we want to build shelter, and I explained that earlier, that we went through, said which ones are these are available for permanent supportive housing, and then the second wave was for shelter, so we undertook that. Here in Eagle Rock, there was one property that was available, um, and it went out to bid. No one bid on it to build uh, any permanent supportive housing, um, but um, it's still going to be on the Which one's in meeting with the housing department to see what we should do? Yeah, so we're going to meet with the housing department to see what we can do next. Yeah. Um, so this asks if, uh, if we can, you can speak to the safety issues related to gang violence. Uh, and also the support that you're giving to the police and how citizens and police are working together. Well, I think one of the, the, our best assets here, as the captain mentioned, was our senior lead officers who are here and know our community. They spend time with people. They go to our, all our organizational meetings. Uh, and I think that communication and constant contact uh, goes a long way. Uh, and uh, the way I support our LPD is first of all in our budget process, I make sure we support whatever they request. It's not a, always uh, that way for the whole police department, but here in Northeast LA, uh, given the new police station and, um, and just making sure that uh, they are accessible and available, that that goes a long way. So I think you want to add to that, Captain? Or? <coughs> Thank you. So several years ago, the department has changed their, their philosophy. We're not, we're not going to arrest our way out of any problem anymore. We want to work in partnership, as I mentioned earlier, with the community. Something the mayor's office uh, has and we uh, support it is the uh, GRID program, the Gain Reduction Youth Development Program. And it, there's, there's two components. There's the uh, uh, interventionist group and there's a prevention. So if there's a critical incident, a shooting, um, we're going to send an interventionist. These are former gang members, many of them, that will come out, that know the neighborhood, they work for the city, and they'll go out there and they'll get the feel, and they'll, they'll try and keep everybody down. The other option is, or the other facet is the prevention program. These are nonprofits that usually provide services to family members and offer counseling, help, assistance, whatever they can to try and improve the, the quality of life for these, for these families and support for these families. One of the programs that's coming up here, and I think the, the councilman mentioned it, is the summer night, summer night Lights program. Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, we shut down the park. We don't shut down the parks. The parks are open to kids, and there's police officers there. And you may see these. We have one here at the closest one is in Highland Park. We have one in Glasshouse Park also. But you'll see police officers playing basketball with the kids. You'll see police officers playing games with the kids. Again, we want to get away that seat that, you know, and many of us do it in this room to this day. We're driving police cars. If you don't behave, the police officers are going to take you away, you know? We want to get away from that mistake. We're here to protect and to serve. And we got to get them at a young age. Because if we get them at a young age, we give them something else to do, they see there's alternatives, and it's been proven way more effective than the old traditional just arrest them and send them to prison. Another question that asks, uh, why are filming companies not held to the same traffic laws as, uh, oh, <laughs> but you're not the one that wrote this question. And to operate regularly at same locations without requiring them to compensate adjacent residents for the resulting uh, in set in, oh, well, not, okay. So, there's a group called Film LA that handles all community outreach for uh, filming companies. And uh, interestingly, today, my staff here in Northeast LA met with Film LA and uh, we uh, wanted to address some of the concerns that we have been hearing from some residents. Uh, and as we could, they're very responsive. Um, and if we, if we contact them, sometimes I found, it's just the way it works, that if individual residents contact them, they kind of like, okay, we'll get to it. Our, if the council offices calls, it's a different reaction, and so they might want to be more accommodating to 
the, the local residents. So they are disrupting the local community or doing something that you feel they should not block your driveway or do other things like that. Uh, call our office and we'll contact Film LA. Uh, and also, um, uh, to compensate, we could also set up a meeting with you and Film LA to see sometimes they do compensate uh, local residents for uh, disruptions and other things like that. So uh, uh, I would advise that you work through our office to work with Film LA in, in issues like this. Our other question is, uh, we've seen as a city, especially on the site, walk on Figueroa under the freeway to be in violation of the American Disabilities Act, which requires accessible sidewalk pathways, clear obstruction, wheelchairs, people with walkers, and pass on that. Um, yes, and one of the things, why we go on and clean up encampments is, is especially if they're blocking the public right of way. Sometimes it's difficult because we have an ordinance that coincides with the American with Disabilities Act that um, we will enforce cleanups if there is sufficient storage available, and that is through some legal precedent that has been established with the city of LA when we were sued. So it, 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 we need to build more storage here locally as well, because as we found in many communities that historically hadn't had as many homeless, that um, it was an issue, but now we have public storage someplace, we could more easily go enforce 5611, which allows us to clean up an encampment should they be blocking a public right of way. Uh, what we are doing is, like I said, next year we're going to have more teams, outreach teams out there, ask them if they need services, and then uh, by enforcing 5611, this also means that tents are not allowed to be up during the day. So if we have sufficient storage nearby, uh, tents are not allowed to be up during the day. They have to take them down so that they do not obstruct um, um, the public right away. I anticipate that if we are able to identify a local location to provide some storage, we will. We could enforce 5611 and we will request that the individuals take down the tents. We have to find a balance between individuals who are down on their luck and need assistance but also if people are blocking the public right of way, 5611 is intended to do that. It's during the day, uh, obviously you should allow people to move through the sidewalk. So I think, and hopefully this next coming year, that, that situation will be improved with more outreach. And through the budget request that I'm making, that I mentioned earlier, which is to get more uh, cabinet cleaning up crews out here as well. What is happening with Taco Bell? Right. <laughs> That's what it says. Nobody likes their food, or you do like the food. No, is it good food? No. Um, I think it's it's undergoing some renovations, and they contact the, the city. Was this your question? Okay. They, they contact the city, and it, it, it falls under the Colorado specific plan. As many of you know, we have a specific plan on Colorado, which is very good because it gives a design guidelines and what you can and cannot have out so that everything is consistent and we don't get the crazy development on, on Colorado. Uh, and it's worked very well over the years, I think. But they are undergoing some renovations and they are now uh, speaking with the city about uh, complying with the Colorado specific plan. That's, that's as much as I know. All right, parking. Parks. It says homeless parking tickets. Homeless parking tickets. Yes. And this will be the last question, and then. Oh, is there more? Oh, you got these three. Okay, three. I asked a question about the homeless uh, and the parking. I'll make it very quick. Uh, my son and I have uh, been living here in the last five years. We've been healthy feeding the homeless at two church, uh, five, the Ewok Covenant Church, and, and, and the lodge, uh, the Eagles Lodge over there. Yeah. So my question is, what about using Civil Brand Women's Institute, a, a, a non-use facility for homeless, for inmate, it used to be an inmate reception center, it's been closed for several years, and it's owned by the county. I know that a person that you're familiar with, Corey Molina, yeah. was against opening it up, but I'm asking for the reconsideration of that, since it seems a perfect facility, it's in your neighborhood. Would you consider that? The second thing with regard to the parking ticket is predatory parking. I got a ticket for parking 18 inches away from the curb today. So I'm complaining about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I will consider that. I wasn't aware of your first issue, but I'll, we'll look into that. Yeah. Thank you very much. How can we improve pedestrian safety in Yosemite? Um, 
I know my staff is currently working with uh, the Department of Transportation, um, and we are making, uh, we want to make sure that the lights there have flashing lights, but, uh, so we're considering that right now. I don't know the details on that, but we want to make sure that we examine that. I know it's been uh, an issue that I see on social media, so I suspect I know who wrote this question, but um, uh, we're, we're working on it, and I know it's a priority for some people. Uh, we, we are focused on Rock Boulevard right now, but Yosemite is also high up there. We'll, we'll get some responses soon from DOT from the questions that we asked. So this question asks um, how uh, homeless are being dealt with in the Walgreens parking lot. Okay. If they're on the par in the parking lot, um, we, uh, there's different rules that apply, and what we've asked there is for LAPD to work with uh, Walgreens, and I know LAPD has been working with Walgreens, and um, that's the situation I see, we see there. But that's a different response that we have if they are not in a public right-of-way. Uh, and if they are, other rules apply there, if but disrupting people, that's an issue. But um, one of the things that I want to get across to people sometimes is that just because we look at a person and we may think they're homeless and they're hanging out somewhere and moving around, that does not... Oh, they're in their cars. Oh, they're in their cars? Okay. Oh, okay. Then we will let... They're there right now? They're there. Okay, we will bring that to LAPD's attention because if they are sleeping in their cars, that's not permitted. Um, and, and one of the things we wanted to do is that it's permitted at certain parts of the city, but I would assume that this is not one of those. Um, they, we, as a city, passed a law recently, maybe two years ago, that says sleeping in the cars permitted in certain parts like industrial areas, etc. Because we want to recognize that some people, that's their only option. Yes, sleeping in the cars, they come and buy something from the house. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 I see. I see. That's the type of issue we bring to the LAPD's attention so they get more particular details and then they can go out there and, and examine that and see what they can do. Okay. So this one discusses uh, the tenants losing their homes as a, as a result of no-fault evictions, uh, loss of Ellis Act, uh, Ellis Act losing the rent-stabilized housing, um, and what you can do at, uh, uh, as a plum committee chair to protect tenants and also whether the repealing the Costa Hawkins Act, which is the, which is the law that um, establishes our rules uh, for rent stabilization, whether you would support that repeal. Yes, yes we would support the repeal of that. Um, yes, I would support the repeal of that. Uh, we need to re-examine that, but also um, I found that uh, people who live under rent stabilization, uh, they're protected, right? They have additional protections from evictions. But uh, I found that given the state of the market right now, where people get more for their properties and rents, a lot of our tenants being harassed by different activities. And so I put in a motion to examine, and it's coming back soon to council to see what we, we could have an anti-harassment policy. Uh, for tenants, something similar to what the city of Santa Monica did that adds additional protections because right now there's state law that we follow, but we could add things in there that give further protections locally and the city of LA currently doesn't have any rules like laws like that. So city of Monica, uh, Santa Monica has did something similar and we're looking to do that to give additional protections. Uh, so this one asks about the development uh, where there used to be the Sizzler and now is the Athens Gardens uh, restaurant. I mean, so, oh. so there's been a development proposed there, but right now there's a new restaurant that went in. Yeah, they're proposing, I think, 36 units, uh, and that's going through the process. So I would ask that as it goes through the process, the process it will have a public hearing, it will go through the neighborhood council, and that's your opportunity to give some input as to what you would like to see. And to be quite honest, I follow the community's lead. The neighborhood council is there to advise the city departments, to advise my office on several issues. On developments, I'm probably batting 98% on any neighborhood council in my district that advises me on a project. So, uh, um, and I'll follow the lead of the community, and not, they not only go to the Navy Council, but they go to Terra and other organizations 
to either get a nay or a yay or give some input, uh, make it more compatible with the neighborhood. So please keep an eye on that project and, and uh, let us know what you think and uh, it'll eventually come to City Council for, for approval. Two more, two more questions is all. Um, this one has a concern that, that claims up to 50% of homeless are from outside of the area, and if there's something that you can do about that. Yeah. But I think as you mentioned before. Yeah, earlier I touched upon this, and I think 85% um, um, of the people experiencing homelessness have um, been here for over five years. So um, we have, do have some people who come in from out of state, and we hear that over because of the climate, right? It's nicer weather than other places, and you can stay out on the street here compared to other places. Um, but a majority of people are have been here longer than five years, um, so that that's the statistic. Uh, we do have, obviously, as any place, uh, it, you know, I don't know what the numbers are recently, but California has historically been an in-migration state where we take populations. More people are coming here than leaving. Uh, I think there was one year, a few years ago, where that didn't happen. It was the opposite. I think they all went to Arizona. I don't know why, but um, it was, it was, they found a lot of people went to Arizona. Um, but uh, but it, it's majority of people are here have been here five years or longer. So I like this one. I don't know how we timed it to finish with this, but this is good. I think I'm going to read this one. Okay. <laughs> how might we best? Efficiently and creatively support your office and staff who so valiantly support and serve us. <laughs> well, I think you could help us by staying involved. Because if you stay involved, that means less work for us, right? Probably no, more work for us, because then you bring stuff to us. No, but I, I think by you staying involved helps all of us. I think we've, we've gotten a good partnership. And quite frankly, you know, over the years, since when I first started over 12 years, there, there were like controversial issues all the time, right? And like, it was always some big issue happening here, 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 happening there. Over the last few years, things have been fairly steady in Eagle Rock. The biggest concern maybe two, three years ago when crime started to go back up, Pillar Hedge was an issue, which, what are you gonna do with Pillar Hedge? It's a vacant, and that quacky thing at the top. And, but now things are pretty, sta pretty, pretty stable and not too many um, major issues. The one is neighboring uh, uh, Glendale with their building of their, of their plant. But here locally, things are smooth. We do fix things uh, and we have fixed the streets. We've got to fix the sidewalks, get improve our sidewalks. Uh, crime is going down, so things look fairly good in this beautiful community called Eagle Rock. So, don't speak too soon. I'm trying to, I slow my, I stop myself. So, thank you so much. Uh, have a good night. Thank you for coming.